Good evening, everyone. It's nice to have you here. My name is Mark Baranek. My name is Mark Baranek. The reason we're using the microphone is because for those people that are all over the country and people that are in Canada, they are able to watch this live streamed. So there's a camera right up there and we are here and Miguel is here. It's, uh, it's being also recorded and will be put on YouTube for those people that can't watch it tonight live. It's being recorded and then will be, uh, will be sent to anybody that wants the link. So as I said, my name is Mark Baranek. I work here at Temple Beth Shalom. I'm the Director of Congregational Engagement here and uh, we're on, on behalf of Temple Beth Shalom, we're honored to have you in our beautiful and cold sanctuary. We do that on purpose so people stay awake. Um, we, we look forward to an informative evening tonight. Um, you're going to hear some of the details for a really impacting upcoming experience that's uh, just about two months away at this point. So to introduce the evening and to uh, begin our program, all of you have seen the name dozens of times. You've emailed with him, you've probably spoken to him on the phone, and now you get to meet the legend in person, the person that puts this whole march together, Mel Mann. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, let me echo, Can you, I'm sure that you got, I, they're not going to answer me, but I'll, for those of you who are streaming in, uh, we're only a few minutes behind, um, you'll take a look at the board just to let you know that if you have questions towards the end of the session, I hope you can see it, but I also sent everyone an email today. Feel free to text me. We'll let you know when we have uh, questions and answers. So welcome. Um, there's a lot of information that we're going to share with you, but I'm sure by now you know that I will email you to the 10th degree. It's a lot easier when you're not uh, around. You can look at your iPhone or your iPad and make reference. Um, I didn't feel the need to give you all a laundry list. I already sent it out. There's a lot of things we're going to do by email. It's a lot more efficient and you can print it out at your leisure, you can look at it whenever you want to instead of inundating you with printed material tonight. Um, the, the real important reason we're getting together tonight uh, is uh, we call it an icebreaker, but more importantly it's an opportunity to get to know one another, to set the tone for the trip, and most importantly to have an opportunity to hear from our survivor. Sadly, Mr. Baranek is not going to be able to travel with us, but we're going to do the next best thing. Martin's going to be here tonight, and each of you are going to be given a copy of his book, his recently published memoir, which every teen that's going on the March of the Living has already been given. Every single student has been given that book, and um, I'm proud to announce that every incoming freshman at Florida International University next year, it'll be on their required reading. It's a fascinating tale, and we're going to get into that a little bit later. Uh, Martin and I will go through a, a little question and answer and um, I think you'll, you'll have a, a wonderful opportunity to learn his story. While we're on the trip, we will be Skyping or FaceTiming or WhatsApping, whichever uh, app will work while we're there, but we're going to hear from Martin while we're there, and that'll be as good as we can get it. Um, we're blessed that Martin and his lovely wife Betty are here tonight. If you can't figure out the connection, Martin is Mark's father. <laughs> so. Uh, we have, that was the whole idea, father and son teen, and together we have done many of these trips together, uh, and it's uh, been very impactful. So, by now, let, let me give you a quick update. By now, everybody has paid. By now, everybody except for two people, and you know who you are, have not arranged your flights yet. Uh, by now, I hope everybody has figured out a way to arrange for some travel insurance. Sanctuary. There'll be a link to live streaming. For those of you who are still, well, if you can see me, then you're, you're already connected. But uh, I'm glad that she texted you. Um, please make sure that you have some form of travel insurance. Um, the reasons are not for lost luggage. The reasons are not necessarily because you may lose your money that you've paid for the trip, although I don't want to minimize that. It's primarily for medical evacuation. On a March of the Living trip about six years ago, on the final day of the trip, a young, healthy, avid skier slipped and fell and broke his back. 
and the medical evacuation back to Miami for surgery was in excess of $35,000. And without that insurance, it's incredibly, incredibly imposing because you're in Poland and they're not moving you unless you're paid. Have the insurance, it's a done deal. Uh, I looked up today, I use a website called insuremytrip.com, which I've sent to you and I'll continue to send you. Um, you can buy a plane program for as little as $100. You can buy a custom fancy platinum program for like $200. Many of you may already have it automatically on American Express. Many of you may already have it if you buy an annual add-on to your other insurances that you have in your, ho your home or your business. But please don't leave home without it. It's really in your best interest. Um, Poland has come a long way, a long, long way since the days of communism. I will tell you that their medical facilities are excellent. Their, their medical help is good. They are really top-notch. They're no longer behind the scenes. Um, the one thing that you do, you do need to know is they need to be paid before they'll give you service. So it's like any other foreign country. They want to make sure that their hospital and their doctors are paid for. Um, a lot of this I'm going to share with you by email. I, I actually don't want to even go on with that because it's just details. It's just uh, bookkeeping or housekeeping, as they say. Any question? Oh, he put his hand up. Um, I want to talk a little bit about we have 40. And I capped it. We've already turned people away. Uh, we have people, for those of you who are tuning in, we have several from Toronto, from New Jersey, from Boston, Phoenix, uh, people who are friends and relatives of those that are coming from Miami and others that got shut out of last year's trip. Last year's trip had five buses and uh, they filled up and people were put on a wait list. So some of those people are coming with us this year. 40 is a perfect, perfect size. Bigger is, is tough. A bathroom stop takes too long. Smaller isn't bad either, but 40 is a perfect size. Waiting for us in Poland, we have a fantastic Polish, they call themselves pilots, but that's the information that they'll give us for the stuff on the ground. Um, I want to say something about Mark because I'm going to turn this program over to Mark, um, and that will generally be the order of our day while we're traveling. Uh, Mark is probably the, if not the, foremost Holocaust educator in South Florida, if not the U.S. and in Canada. Uh, this will probably be Mark's 20th plus trip. And Mark has, um, is an education director, and in, in this particular synagogue, he's also a director of programming and everything else that they do here. But his depth of knowledge and experience in teaching the Shoah is immeasurable. And we're very, very fortunate to have someone like Mark with us. Uh, you can Google Mark and see a lot more about his bio. Uh, he does a lot more than Jewish education. Uh, his involvement with teens in our community and with adults in our community is exemplary, and uh, it, it'll really be a low-stress affair. Um, nothing is off-limits in terms of questions and answers, and you know the knowledge is there. It's not like somebody going to be reading out of a book every day. So uh, we're really fortunate and blessed. Uh, this, for me, is my 20th trip. I've gone to many different roles. Uh, from photographer to bus captain to schlepper, whatever. Um, I'm also a son of Holocaust survivors, and during the trip, you're going to get a little bit of flavor. Uh, we have another gentleman that's with us that's also a son of Holocaust survivors. So there's going to be a, a, um, a gelling of our group, and there'll be a lot of information that's exchanged along the way. And um, I, I will tell you, there are some people that applied to go on this trip that I turned down because I did not think that they were appropriate for our group and I sent them to different regions. So I think we have a really fantastic running start. All right, the time is 7.20. Um, one thing that's really important, and I think that you've already gathered that from my emails, I will follow up on everything over and over and over. Because when we get to Poland, um, there's no computers for me. You know, I'm, I'm on the ground. The best I can work with is this. So I try to take care of everything before we leave. Um, at the end of the program today, you're going to be given a goodie bag. Uh, for the, we don't have all of, the, all of the stuff to give out, but whatever we do have, we will give you today, and whatever else we can get from the National uh, Marginal Living Office, we'll either send to you or we'll have waiting for you when we get to Poland. There'll be jackets, this lovely shirt, there'll be a cap, there'll be a little tote bag, and we'll explain that to you a little bit later, the purpose of the backpack and the purpose of the, the tote bag uh, as we go forward. So. Without further ado, without taking up any more time talking about logistics and stuff like that, I think uh, we really want to hear from our, our maven, our educator, and we really appreciate Mark for having us all here. Thank you to Beth Shalom.
Thank you. You know, uh, oftentimes when we've taken groups, there's people that have said, oh, I've seen all the movies, I've read all the books. I will tell you this from experience. There's nothing like seeing the real thing. And once we get to Poland on April 29th, and, and then we'll meet together on Tuesday morning, April the 30th, before you know it, we're going. We're moving, and we're going to be together and sharing, really, one of the most impacting experiences, we think, of your lifetimes. To be together and see some of the places that we're going to see. One of the things that's important is that we don't ever want to tell you how you're going to feel because you're going to feel whatever you'll feel based on your experience and, and, and what you're thinking at the time and, and what you're seeing. There's no one that can tell you what you're going to feel. I will guarantee you this, though. It will be as impacting as anything that you've ever done in your lives. And the fact that we're going to be together and we're going to be a community of 39 participants and staff, probably a group close to 45 with everyone, with security and, and a, a guide and so on, a navigator. Um, it, it's going to be very special together. I will tell you this, as, as the educator on the trip, it's really important to know this is not a vacation. This is not some things you're going to have to do out of your comfort zone. And you're going to have to remember that you're part of a group. This isn't an individual experience. And, you know, you're adults. For many, many years, Mel and I and my dad, we took teens. And with teens, we were up at 6 in the morning, and we had services, and it had to be this, and they had to do that. You're adults. You're treated as adults. And we'll tell you the night before that tomorrow morning, the next morning, the bus is leaving at 7, at 7.30, at 8. Whatever that is, you're all adults enough that you have to be ready to go when the bus leaves. And, and I will tell you, it's frustrating for us as staff when, when there are people not on the bus, not ready to go, and 90% and of the group is on the bus ready. So that's all we're going to tell you. We're, we're staying at lovely hotels, and there's plenty of time to have breakfast, to get up. They're, they're really, you know, Mel can tell you a little bit more about each of the hotels, which we've both been at many times. But once the day starts, we go, and we have these different experiences day by day. On the first day, on Tuesday, when we're all together, again, Mel will, will be telling you, will be sending you the details of what time, but Tuesday morning... The program itself starts officially in the afternoon. But Tuesday morning, we're going to get together after breakfast. The room will be determined, and we'll have a little icebreaker. And for many of you, it will be the first time that you will, all, you will see the entire group for the first time. People that are coming from the Northeast, people that are coming from Canada, people that are coming from the West Coast. Everyone will be arriving the day before on April the 29th. And then on Tuesday morning, April the 30th, we'll have our first icebreaker and, and get to know each other. We'll give you a few hours off. And then we will begin that afternoon in Krakow. And it's, it's a very, you know, Mel worked with the people from, from Gesher Travel in Israel to coordinate all the programs. You have to remember this. There are thousands of people that will be in Krakow at the same time. Groups from all over the world. Just last week, Mel was at a meeting with delegations from all over the world, and they have to coordinate where each group will be so, so there aren't a 1,000 people at the same place. And so we've timed that, and we've coordinated that, and we have a, a really firm schedule. And so that first day, we'll be in Krakow, and we'll be spending the afternoon walking through a beautiful area of Krakow. We'll, we'll have the evening together. And the next morning, we will spend time, we will be going, getting on the bus, and going to Auschwitz in the morning, and then Auschwitz II or Birkenau in the afternoon. And that's a very powerful day, and this is one day before the March of the Living itself. And that takes place the next day on Thursday. But that day in, in, on Wednesday... The first part of the day will be in Auschwitz, what's called Auschwitz I. 
We'll be there. We'll have lunch nearby and then spend the afternoon in Birkenau. It's at that point that we hope we'll be able to WhatsApp video or Skype with my father at the time because one of the most powerful moments over the years has been my dad speaking in one of the barracks in Birkenau where he was in 1944. That evening is Erev Yom HaShoah. One of the beauties of the March of the Living is the, is the calendaring where there are three holidays that are celebrated throughout the March of the Living, and that's if you continue on to Israel. The first is Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Memorial Day. The second is in Israel, Yom HaZikaron, Israel's Memorial Day. And the third is right the next day, Yom Atzmaut, Israel's Independence Day. So to be with thousands of fellow Jews around the world on Arab Yom HaShoah, Mel is, is very involved in that program and the, in the uh, planning and, and details. I've been fortunate to be at that program for a number of years, and it's a very impacting, very moving program that evening of Arab Yom HaShoah. The next day we get ready for the actual March of the Living. And that is a symbolic march that takes place from Auschwitz to Birkenau. And there we will be together with thousands of other teens and adults from all over the world. And we'll have that march, which will begin with the sounding of the shofar at the Arbet Macht Frei sign in Auschwitz. And then we'll continue on to Birkenau. And there will be part of a delegation of adult delegations sitting in a specific area for the program that takes place um, that afternoon. And then we will head to Warsaw. Um, it's a long ride, but it's you know one of, one of the really special times when we'll be spending a lot of time in Poland on the buses. And there'll be times on the buses where we'll speak. There'll be times when you just want to rest and you probably don't want to hear anyone speaking on the microphone. One of the beauties of having done this 20 times is that you know when not to talk, and you know when people want to just rest. The worst is when, you know, we used to have the kids say to the adults, shut up, stop talking, shut up, no. That doesn't happen on our bus. We, we know, we, we've got this pretty down pat when to talk and when not to. And, um, you know, when we get close to each of the places that we're going to see, We'll get you ready. We'll tell you. You know, th there's not going to be any times where you will not know what's going on. We will make sure that every night before we, we say goodnight uh, on the bus or, or in the mornings, uh, if we see you at breakfast, to make sure that you have the things that you'll need for the day. We'll give you tips for, for that next day as we go on. The next morning... Uh, once we arrive, and it'll be a long night, and we'll have a late dinner in Warsaw, we are, are going to be at Treblinka. We're going to Majdanek. So we're going to be going for about a three-hour bus ride to Lublin and uh, then to, to one of the difficult places of Majdanek. We'll be there on Friday. We will come back in time for Shabbat. And I will tell you, for those of you that celebrate Shabbat, those of you that do not celebrate Shabbat, Shabbat will be a very special experience after having spent three or four days together in Poland seeing the things that we've seen. And to welcome in Shabbat together, we'll be with other adults and other groups, staying in a lovely hotel in a beautiful room. We'll also spend Kabbalat Shabbat just across from our hotel with a group of Canadians, and it's a short, beautiful 45-minute Kabbalat Shabbat service on Friday evening. We'll have dinner, we'll have a chance to hear stories and sing a little. Shabbat morning, we will, um, those that will want, will go with myself and with Mel to the Nojik Synagogue. And there is, is a, a beautiful synagogue that's been restored numerous times for Shabbat morning services, again, for those that want to go. Um, in the afternoon after lunch, we will take a tour of the Warsaw Ghetto and spend time walking around the Warsaw Ghetto and visiting the newest uh, museum that we've watched over the years develop from ground up called Pauline. Mel has, spent, uh, Mel has taken seminars there. We'll have guides and, and walk through 
the history of Jewish life in Poland over, these la over, over the past 10 centuries. Um, and, and we'll do that, and then we'll have the evening free in, in, in Warsaw on Saturday night. And, and again, we can give you ideas what to do. Mel, Mel's, Mel's a uh, fountain of knowledge when it comes to options, what to do in Poland, in Warsaw that night. Sunday morning, we will begin our day in uh, the Warsaw Cemetery. And I hate to say cemeteries are beautiful, but the Warsaw Cemetery is really special. There are, are stories to tell. There are things to see. Um, some of the greats of, of Polish Jewry are, are buried in that cemetery, and we'll visit some of the graves there. And then we will take a one-and-a-half to two-hour bus ride to Treblinka and spend time in Treblinka that afternoon, and we're on Sunday, and then Sunday night after we get back from Treblinka, we head off. Um, we get to the airport. Mel will take over in a second there. I do want to say this just before Mel takes the microphone and, and speaks to my father is this. I hope you come with an open mind. I hope you come ready to learn. You know, it, it's um, when, when we're at different sites and when we're explaining, I, I encourage you each time to come as close as possible because there's going to be 40 of us to come as close as possible so you can always hear what we're saying and what we're teaching. And, and we're not going to spend a lot of time because we're going to be moving throughout. And, and I just want to tell you as the educator on this trip and having worked with Mel many times, I want to tell you how much I'm looking forward to being there with you, to being able to answer any questions that you have in guiding you through these places as we go through Poland. Thank you very much, everyone. You're not done yet. Mark, Mark please sit next to me. Mark, you're not finished. I just wanted to add a little bit about the Budapest thing because that's still in formation. Um, something that Mark touched upon that I want to expand on. He mentioned the word, we're adults. We're staying in five-star hotels in the center of two beautiful cities. And I will tell you that uh, time permitting, and of course your, your stamina permitting, uh, for example, in Krakow, we're no more than two blocks away from one of the prettiest squares in Europe, not just in Poland, but in Europe. And we purposely designate, I purposely designated where we're staying and where we're, what we're doing so that there's ample time to take in some sites. You're not just going to be studying death and dying. You're not just going to be studying Jewish history, but you'll have an opportunity to also take in. Uh, I can promise you that the pilot that we have, the guide, uh, will also be very helpful. So there, uh, there's ample time for you to take in stuff there. Similarly, the hotel in Warsaw is right in the heart of uh, the, the city. Uh, within walking distance, there's a magnificent shopping area, if that's something that you feel like you want to do. There's gyms in the, in the hotel itself, if you people are gym rats and you want to work out. Um, the top of the hotel has an amazing bar on the 40th floor that overlooks the entire town. So there'll be ample opportunity in addition to a, a program that's powerful, meaningful, emotional to, uh, to have a release because that's something that's also very important. Uh, many of you have asked me about, gee, when can I see my son or daughter that's participating in the Child's March of the Living? Well, trust me, we're not staying anywhere in, in the same hotels at the same time. But w our, our schedules will be overlapping. There'll be many times when there'll be a hi, how are you kind of experience. But by design, we have planned to be with the teens in Birkenau on that very first day. And it's very important for both us to see what they're experiencing and for them to see what we're experiencing so that when they come back from the trip, they know that when they're sharing with you, you get it. They understand that you were there and you understand what they've seen. So these are some things that uh, I'm trying to answer all the emails that have come to me in the last two weeks and I, I'm trying to get an opportunity. So let me finish the schedule quickly and then we go on to the second segment. Um, we take off, for those of you who are staying, I'm sorry, for those of you who are not going to Budapest, you'll be staying in Warsaw the final evening, which is Sunday, and then Monday morning, May 6th, you return either to the States or you take off to other parts unknown. Uh, for those of us that go on to Budapest, we'll be flying. It's a very short shuttle flight, and we, are, we land in Budapest at about 7 p.m. We'll have an opportunity to have dinner together. And um, we have what I'm told, and, and I've been to Budapest before and, and scoped it out, probably the finest guide on the ground. Her name is Aggie Antal. She's very highly recommended. Our hotel is the beautiful Marriott on the Danube River 
In fact, I was there pre-renovation and I was blown away. And since I was there in November of 17, they've completely renovated it. So everything in the hotel has been refreshed. Uh, beautiful hotel. The beauty of it is we're within walking distance of everything. Uh, we are never more than a half a mile from the furthest point of whatever we are going to be seeing that day. It's fully guided the first day, all of the Jewish sites, the Holocaust sites, and uh, uh, other wonderful opportunities. We're going to have group dinners. We're going to partake in their amazing music and their wine. And um, that'll be the day that we, uh, the first day Monday that we're in Budapest. Day two in Budapest is on a bus because we'll be guiding and going into areas that we'll be leaving the center of town to see various castles and various palaces and other things that Budapest, Buda and Pest have to offer, depending on which side of the river. Um, for those of you who are not going on to Israel, uh, you'll be staying in Budapest that night which is uh, Tuesday evening, the 7th, and then the next morning you're flying back or going to other places. But those of us that are continuing on to Israel, our flight leaves at about 11.30 in the evening. We get to Israel early morning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass on the Israel program per se, because I will tell you out of a total group of 39, we have 15 that are going on to Israel. And I, I'm more comfortable telling you one thing. We're joining another group, the Southern Region March of the Living, and... Um, we will, I, I will be going to Israel, Mark will be going to Israel, but then in Israel we pretty much have our own independent, I'm going to stay with the group, Mark's going to be visiting with family, although Mark will probably come back to Latrun on Yom Ma'ut. I'm sure that Nava, his wife's family, will join us, so you know, we're not done with Mark when we get to Israel, we'll all be together, but we are merging. What typically happens with the adult groups is roughly half the people do not go on to Israel because they can't uh, take two weeks away from their family or their work, so we're blending with another South Florida group. Before we go on, before you have an opportunity to introduce uh, and, and have a, dis uh, a nice dialogue with our survivor, one of the things that Mark mentioned and I, I highlighted briefly are the characters and the people and the quality of the people that we have on our trip. I didn't say enough about Mark, and I, wanna, I don't want to embarrass him. You will understand when you're on the trip. And, um, you know, there are many trips that I don't have the privilege of having Mark with me as the educator, and I'm the educator but I can't burn a candle to his depth of knowledge and his style. So we're really lucky that the two of us are working as a team. Um, our organization is the Friends of the March of the Living, and I'll take 60 seconds or less. For any of you who have seen my emails at the bottom, you see there's a link. Check our website out. You'll see what we do. The teens that travel with Miami and Broward, anybody who has a financial aid need, we fund it. And we do that on the generosity of our donors. We run golf tournaments. and trips like the one we're running. Uh, every organization has lay leadership. And we're very pleased and very honored that the president of the Friends is traveling with us, and he wanted to say hello to everybody and greet everybody. So this is Howard Schneider, and you're going to learn to love him. Howie? Hi. I'm Howard Schneider, and as Mel said, I'm the fr president of the Friends of the March of the Living. And what we do is we provide, we are the, the funding for um, about $120,000 worth of scholarships to the students in Dade and Broward County every year. Uh, we have a, uh, an endowment that we manage, and uh, trips like this are one of the ways that we raise money. Uh, the golf tournament uh, is another, another way that we raise uh, our funds. Uh, I've known Mel for, uh, for over 40-something years, a good friend of mine, and uh, he got me involved in this. And uh, I'm going to tell you, if you haven't l realized it by now, he really is a special guy. Uh, I welcome you, and uh, look forward to spending the uh, the trip with you. If you have any questions, give me a holler, give Mel a holler, or Mark. Thanks, Howie. Thank you. Um, we're. We've been talking about it, and I think we're going to go into it right now because I think it's important for us to have um, great information. Uh, the March of the Living was designed originally, starting in 1988, to be an opportunity to give Holocaust survivors a platform for us to um, understand what really happened, to experience with them as eyewitnesses. Elie Wiesel said, when you learn from a witness, you become the witness. And 
I'm a child of survivors, and I have to tell you that my own parents did not share, did not publicly speak. They made their tape for Spielberg, and they have their, their video in the, in the archives in Washington, but they didn't engage in public speaking. They didn't, they didn't feel comfortable doing that, and they were, they were tarnished. They were harmed. Come out of a Shoah like that, not everybody has the ability to talk about their worst nightmare. Um, my first March of Living was 1996, and I was, although Mark and I had been close friends and worked together as colleagues for about seven, eight years by that time, uh, he says, you know, you're going to meet my dad. My dad's going to come on this trip with us. Wow, I didn't know who he was, but I had heard a lot about him. To say the least, um, Martin Baranek is one, one amazing, unique person. Not so much because he's a Holocaust survivor. Not so much because he was a success in his personal and business life, but because of who he is as a person. Warm, gracious, generous, funny. Um, what he endured in his lifetime is miraculous. Uh, married to an amazing woman, Betty, who has been his partner, his, uh, his Azer Konegdo, as they say in Hebrew, his, his life's partner has been amazing. The two of them are amazing people. And um, regrettably, because of some illness and doctor's orders, he may not be with us physically, but he's going to be with us each and every day on this trip. And one of the things that we've done for all of us is we're going to give you a copy of his book, and he will sign it for you. It's a recently published memoir. It's a fascinating, fascinating story of one person's trip through hell and come back and to talk about it. So we're really privileged. And Martin, I'm going to ask you to please come up and sit next to me, if you don't mind. And... Um, <laughs> Wait, I'm going to give you the microphone, Martin. <laughs> Wait, Mark. Martin Brachovan, who is a survivor of this trip. No, 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 you have to look at the screen. They have to hear you on the back of the camera. Everybody tells me what to do. You see, that's my lot. Is it working? I was supposed to be your uh, survivor on this trip. I've been on 20 some. Unfortunately, my uh, hip didn't cooperate and they told me not to go. So I'm gonna tell you one thing, you're in for some two weeks. I will do anything to go back with you. Unfortunately, my son, my wife, everybody tells me what to do. So I'm not going. Uh, I've been, I was an inmate in Auschwitz at a very young age, and before that I was in the camps in Poland before they transferred us to Auschwitz. So I, at my age, I was very young and very small. I was picked in Auschwitz twice to go to the, to the gas chambers because of my age and my size. Unfortunately to them, fortunately to me, I outsmarted them, and I'm here to tell you about it. Auschwitz, Birkenau, that you're going to see, is one of the cruelest places in the world. I've been there 20 some times. I started actually together with Mel we went both together for the first time, and we keep on going. I hope that you come home from Birkenau, from Auschwitz, and you'll see what Jews in Europe had to go through to survive. And at that, very small percentage did survive. I was 12 years old. When I got away from a train and stole my way into a camp and spent there about a year or so, and then we were sent in Poland, and from there we were sent to Auschwitz. Uh, at my age, you see very, excuse me, very, very few kids. If you did, they lived from one selection to the other selection. In my own case, uh, 
I came with my father, and my, fa my mother went with the women's camp. Uh, my father was uh, two days after our arrival sent to one of the sub camps called Buna. And there people didn't live very long because the, the situations of work and so they couldn't live long. My father passed away about two months after. And I stayed on in Auschwitz until the liquidation of the camp on January the 18th, 1945 where we went on another dead march that I, per, I was uh, transferred to Austria in a camp called uh, Matthausen. If you ever look in on the computer, have a look at it. It'll give you a lesson in, instead of me telling you, not as accurate as the computer will. Uh, I was picked to go to the ovens that was our Lingo. <clears throat> I was picked to go to Rosh Hashanah, 1944, with a friend of mine that we came together to the to the to the guest chambers. Uh, fortunately for us, without going into details, I would have tell you that if I would come with you this way, maybe I'll make you come back again. I did it for 23 times. I was picked to go to the ovens with my friend because of our size. We were picked at the selection. We were under a meter 50. Under a meter 50, you didn't have a chance. Uh, the two of us were put in, in a block, that's a barrack, that was supposed to go the second day to the guest chambers. My friend and I made a run for it and we outsmarted them and we survived for 10 days until 10 days later is Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur was one of the worst selections ever. It was conducted by Dr. Mengele, if you ever heard the name, and he had a meter 50 line. Anybody who doesn't get through the meter 50 is automatically a candidate to go to the guest chambers. My friend and I knew we can make a meter 50. So we hid out until the end of Yom Kippur. They started looking for more people, and they have every day at 5 o'clock was a roll call. We had to line up in the front of the barrack and to see how many people they got, how many died, or whatever, as long as it matched. Uh, we thought we can get away with it. We took two pails and turned them over, stood on the pail to be a little higher. It didn't work for us. They cut us both. And they put us in a, in a barrack that all the people in there were going the next day to the ovens. Uh, most of those people were Hungarian Jews, and they were very religious. They knew all the things not everybody, not all Hungarian Jews, but those people knew every prayer by heart. And they were sitting and praying and praying, and they said, it's God's will. We knew where we're going if we stay there. And uh, Yom Kippur Day, my friend and I watched the, the guards, how they were watching the, the barrack that we were in, but we can make a run of it. So we said, and we watched, we watched how they were changing guards. So we knew around lunchtime, there were four of them, one and two were going and one coming back. So we watched and at one split second, we made the run. And uh, we thought this is it. But we had to go stand at some barrack to be counted because they had the numbers, how many people there are. And we stayed on pails turned over, and it didn't work. They took us back in. My father was able to bring in to Auschwitz two five, gold two five gold pieces. They were very valuable at the time. And in the meantime, they took my father, sent them away to another, bar to another camp. It's called Buna. And my father died in Buna about a month later or so. And um, 
I had the money, I gave it to an uncle of mine to exchange it for smaller monies to buy bread. And he wasn't able, came back from, from his commando, they told him, your nephew was cut and he's going to the ovens tonight. That was Yom Kippur for Nila. They knew every rule, every prayer in the Jewish uh, book. So when my uncle came back, and they said, your nephew is cut and he's going to the, to the, to the uh, guest chambers. And so my uncle went to a couple, a Jewish couple, and he says, look, I got five dollars or two five dollar pieces. Take my, uh, take my nephew out from there. He says, it's not enough. It's not enough. And my uncle says, I don't have any more. So there was a guy that lives down in Toronto, and he, every time he sees me, he says, you owe me $35. I say, I gave $35 to pull you out from that uh, mess. I don't know if it's true or not, but that's what he tells me. He wants, he wants credit for my survival. I say, let him have it. And uh, the couple that took the, the, the $5 gold piece, he says, that's not enough. I need $35 more. He says, that, I got the $35. And my uncle gave him my tattoo, my tattoo numbers because everybody. He wants me to show you my tattoo. It's there; it doesn't go away. And if you, if, if I would remove it, I'd do the biggest sin ever, and I would never even consider that. Some people, I had a cousin in Australia who survived, and he removed it. And I told him, I went to Australia to visit him. I said, why would you do a stupid thing like this? So he starts giving me, oh, now to some ways they wouldn't give me a job. I didn't know English, I couldn't get a job, all that stuff. Anyways, he did it, I wouldn't do it. We stayed until this couple came in, and he had my number written down, because if not, any kid would have say I'm baronic. You know, we knew every trick in the book. To, to survive those camps, you had to be fast, thinking fast, and know every trick. If not, you didn't last long. We, I last till the liquidation of Auschwitz. So anyways, the couple came in and he starts yelling baronic, and about 10 kids running the baronic. So he said, show him your arms. So we showed him the arms, and he pulled me out. Not 10 minutes later, trucks pulled up and took him all to the guest chambers. Within a half an hour, they were all dead. This is the kind of life we were leading. And the civilized Germans knew every trick, everything in the, in the Bible, how to get rid of the Jews. Unfortunately, some of us, lucky, we made it. Uh, uh, also, Another million and a half, I think, were killed at the time. A million and a half children were killed. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know. Is it whiskey? I'll drink it. It's whiskey. <laughs> I know what I know. Sorry about that. The couple came in and he took me out. You know, it was a matter of minutes. You can possibly comprehend that minutes. You know, kids, they knew where they're going. They're going, that was mostly Hungarian kids because there was no more Polish kids. So uh, that was the time they were liquidating all the Jews in Hungary. I got out from there and I, after that, there was still uh, uh, Sukkot. There was a small, a small, group of people taken to the guest chambers, but they didn't burn them, they brought them back, and we didn't know what happened. That was the day there was a, a little revolt, some Jews in the Sonder Commando. Sonder Commando was the commando that worked in the guest chambers, by pulling out people from the guest chambers, taking them in to the fire stand. So, uh, after that, they stopped. We didn't know what happened, 
you were free, you could go from one camp to the other. We didn't know what happened. And then the winter started, the winter of 1945, and in Poland so happened, this year, that year was so cold, we had no clothes. I had the rags around my feet, no socks, no nothing. And that's where we go with rag bags around your feet. And on the 18th of January, the 17th, they brought in a truck with shoes in our barrack. They were in a barrack, maybe 300 people. And they say, pick your shoe, pick your shoes. We didn't know what it was for. And I, uh, as a 14-year-old boy, took a pair of ski shoes. They were nice, polished up. And I took it up. I didn't realize that they're too small and that I don't have no socks. So on the 18th, on a Thursday, I'm uh, not about numbers. They lined us up, we went on a march. We didn't know where we're going. They lined us up five, five in the width. So three guys in the middle were sleeping and the two on the outside were leading. And we got used to changing. So the other three people would sleep a little. And my feet got completely rubbed up from those ski shoes. And it was wounds, and I had no socks, and I couldn't walk anymore. So on the third day, I quit. So a lot of us that quit the first night, we were in Poland. So anybody left, they shot. And the second and third night, we were already in Germany. They were going to shoot civilians in Germany just for their own, you know, propaganda. And um, it so happened, I wasn't only one, about 200 of us, we were thousands, but a few hundred of us were left on the, on the snow. We couldn't walk. And they took us into another camp. They had camps all over the country. And uh, we were sure they were going to shoot us. They didn't. And after a while, they put us up on a train and sent us out. We didn't know where we were going. They parked the, the, the train between military planes from, Ger from German front. They're coming back from Russia. And then Russian came around with planes and started shooting. A lot of us was killed because they didn't know who was in there. And eventually, eventually, uh, they took us by train to uh, Mauthausen. Mauthausen is in Austria. I see a lady knows about those things. And uh, they brought us to Mauthausen naked. They told us to get undressed completely. And they put us in a hot shower and right outside. And it was such a cold winter. That was in January of 44, 45, sorry, 45. And we were naked in a hot shower. Then they gave us a pair of Dutch shoes, you know, those wooden shoes. They were called the Dutch shoes. And uh, that's all we had. Stayed there a whole day. Then they gave us a little blouse and a pair of pants. And a whole day they kept us outside the barrack. At night they let us in, into the barrack. And they put us to sleep, one here and one here. Like head to feet and head to feet and head to feet. And food was the slimmest ever. No comparison. Auschwitz as far as food is concerned, was not that bad. We could survive with it. But in Mauthausen, it was very, very bad. And people were dying from the cold, from this, from that. You went to sleep with a guy because we slept together. He went to sleep. He didn't get up in the morning. I was 14 years old. But I wanted to live. I just wanted to live. I just didn't want to die. After a while, they took us all out from all the Jews, out from Auschwitz. And they took us to another place in Gunskirchen, that just outside of Linz. 
in Austria. Uh, it was a camp, no beds, no nothing, no food. We were in a forest. So the food we had was the trees and the water was from the rain because it was in the spring of, of 1945. A lot of people got sick with dysenteria because from the leaves and the water and they were dying. People were dying there like flies. You went to sleep because we slept the later outside. Four guys in the morning you got up, what is that? Because we slept four, it should be warmer one into the other. And what I'm gonna tell you, nobody thought they'll ever go out from there. People were dying so fast that one Friday, one Friday they've seen jeeps coming into the plant. Oh, they start yelling, it's Americans, it's Americans. And we got finally liberated on May the 4th, 1945. Please take a drink of water. Take a, take a minute. I do this with Martin a lot, so he knows I'm not trying to be discourteous. Um, Martin mentioned something briefly. Uh, first of all, you're going to be given his book. And there's a lot that he's not telling you tonight purposely so that you have an opportunity to read it in his book. And also, when we're in Birkenau and other places during the trip, we'll hear from Martin. And more of his story will make sense, and more of his story will come alive. Martin mentioned he was liberated from Gunskirchen on May 4th, 1945, and that is Martin's birthday. His natural birthday is August 15th, but his rebirth day is May 4th. And we, uh, we always have a good tradition. And when we're together on May 4th, we're going to celebrate Martin's birthday. And uh, we'll do the best that we can using technology. Um, there's more to Martin's story, but I, I, I've been asked by Lisa, the author of the book, and by his family to please let you read the book and take advantage of the opportunity. Um, I have some questions for Martin that I want him to, sh to share with us so that we can take advantage of the precious time that we have together. Uh, Martin explained to you that he's been on the March of the Living. Now, prior to the March of the Living, Martin did share a lot of his stories and did have an opportunity to talk to people. But the platform that was given to him by the March of the Living was really amazing. So I'm going to ask Martin for a few minutes to give you his perspective, a survivor's perspective, um, about his experiences on the march to help you have a better perspective. What are you saying now? What is your frame in Yiddish? Who feels to march it a living to all of us? I think you're doing the smartest things by going on the march of the living. Yeah, right now it looks expensive. I've been on 20 some marches. This is the first year I had to pull out because I have trouble with my back. So hopefully next year I'll be back. I think we Jews have to remember, as it says in the Bible somewhere, Zachor, remember. And uh, we're living a great life in America. I live in Canada with my wife and kids. We're living a great life. Nobody ever dreamt in those years of the 40s of living this life. All we pray to have one day a loaf of bread without a knife. And this was your, this was our prayer. We never, I, I personally, I say to my wife every day, I could have never, never believed that I'll come out from the camps without an education. I only had two years of education in Poland, first two years of public school. <clears throat> During the German occupation, we were not allowed to go to schools. So coming out, Coming to a countries from one country to the other, I wound up in Italy. I lived in Italy for a year, uh, the lit on the Italian Riviera. You see, we were used to that. And from there, I went to Palestine in 19 uh, before uh, two years before the declaration for 45, 46, before the declaration of the state. I went to school there that did me a lot of good. That made sort of, because when we came out from the camps, we weren't people, we were wild animals. We stole whatever we could. 
uh, whether we needed it or not, we still took it because we got used to that life. And went to Italy, lived in Italy over a year. From there, I went on an illegal ship to Palestine in 1940. Uh, 19 That's your job. <laughs> And uh, eventually we came to Palestine. By then, the law came out uh, that it'll ship every sh uh, the ship back the, the refugees to Cyprus. So we were with the group to Cyprus, second ship, second ship back to Palestine. And uh, in Palestine at the time, we were got we got two years school because they uh, tried to make something out of it. We were wild animals, and uh, they succeeded. They had an awful lot of patience, a lot of systems of how to educate boys like this, and they did good. In 1948, the war started with the Arabs. We volunteered to the army, even though I wasn't 18 yet, but uh, I was in the, in the army for a year, a year and a half. Then the Red Cross was looking for me, that my mother survived the war, we didn't know about each other. And my mother had a big family in the United States and Canada. The United States in that year didn't let no refugees in. So she went to Canada and her cousins said, she kept on saying, I think my son is alive. Nobody ever saw him being dead. Nobody heard. So the Red Cross found me in Palestine a few months later, six months later. And that's where I reconnected. And I came to Canada in 1949, December 49. And the rest is history. Then I met my wife. And we married. It, and I think it was a successful marriage because we married for over 60 years. And, and we had a beautiful family I'm so proud of. We had four kids and our oldest son, unfortunately, died of cancer very young, left three kids. And the rest of the kids all educated. One of our sons' is, uh, grandsons is graduating from medicine next month. And one is a very successful lawyer in Canada. So we got nothing. One is right here that is very happy doing what he's doing. And uh, we got nothing to complain. Never dreamt of a life like that. We got a great life. And what else can I tell you? Go on the trip. Enjoy the trip. Remember, grab every day, every hour. You're unless you'll be as stupid as me and come back again. Otherwise, you'll have a time of your life. I'm so sorry I can't come with you. I want, to po I want to point out something. For a man like this to go through the hell that he went through and to have a perspective and to share it with you with humor is really unique. And I don't know what you know about or who you've been around in terms of being with Holocaust survivors, but not everybody came out OK. Uh, I can tell you that my mother and father both came out different. My mother was a victim till the day she died. My father had an attitude like Martin. Every survivor came through this hell a different way. So you understand some of the uniqueness and the amazing part about uh, Martin. Um, we've been mentioning Martin's book, and you're gonna, not going to leave tonight without it. Um, it's called Determined. Uh, Martin uh, gave many, many, many hours uh, of time telling his story and retelling it to a, a phenomenal, amazing person named Lisa Cicero. Uh, for those who may or may not know Lisa here from Bet Shalom, Lisa happens to be an attorney, member of the Jewish community. She did a brilliant job with this. And um, I think you'll find this to be a quick read. Uh, you could probably go through it cover to cover in a few hours. And please read it. Please acquaint yourself with it. Not necessarily just for Martin's story, but for what we're going to see. Because this book is the March of the Living. It talks about what happened before the Holocaust, talks what happened during the Holocaust, the triumph of survival, going to Eretz Yisrael, fighting for the independence of the state. That's the same lessons that we're teaching our teens. So Martin just gave you a little taste. And Martin knows that when I move him along on these programs, it's not out of disrespect. 
Uh, a lot of people are tuning in. And um, Thursday evening this week at Books and Books in Bell Harbor, we're going to have an elongated session. We did the same thing at Books and Books in Pinecrest last week. And um, he's going to speak at much greater length and much greater detail about his life before the Shoah, more of the details with opportunities for more detailed questions and answers, uh, more information about his time in Italy, more information about his amazing time in Israel fighting for the independence of the state of Israel. So if you have nothing else, and maybe you can change a few things around, please join us at Books and Books in Bell Harbor. That's this Thursday evening at 6.30. Uh, and again, maybe between now and then you read his book and, and get uh, more of the information uh, given to you. Mark. Yesterday morning we had a gathering of uh, some, some people that had gone on past marches back in the 90s. And there were five Holocaust survivors. And any of you who are friends with me on Facebook, or I hope we can become friends, there's a picture yesterday with my dad, a woman named Magda Bader, a man named Howard Chandler, who's been friends with my dad for over 80 years from the same town, a man named David Mermelstein, and a man named Joe Sachs, all Holocaust survivors. And there's a picture that we took of them, and they're all smiling got these big, beautiful, all of them, all five of them are smiling. And, and on the caption that we, we put on Facebook yesterday was, look at the outlook of life that they have after all these years, after everything they went through. And it's all about perspective. And speaking of perspective, while we're on the bus and when we have time, we're going to be you know, uh, discussing, uh, you know, and there's going to be time when we're on a, a three-hour bus ride or a four-hour bus ride. It'll be time to relax you know, we'll, Mel will tell you about bringing snacks. We'll stop on the way. One of the traditions that I want to announce now that my father started, I don't know how he started it, but he started it. That is, coming off the bus one day in my Donick, he looks at me and says, I said, they, the kids said to Mar Marty, they call him Marty, Marty, so what do you think, Marty? And Martin looks down and says, boy, I could use a good scotch right now. So, one of the traditions, every time we leave a camp, we have a bottle, we have those little cups on the bus, and we say at least one or two or sometimes more l'chaims together that we've been able to go to a camp and be able to come out, thank God. So, it's, it's a tradition every time we do it, when my dad was with us on the march, and hopefully next year when he's back with us, we do a l'chaim and you know, the bus is shaking and the bus is moving and we're all holding on and so we tell you to sit down. But while you're sitting, you get that little cup and it, it feels really good to have that l'chaim together afterwards. But one of the things that while we're on the bus and when we have time, we'll be discussing some, some current event issues, some, some really sometimes some controversial issues. Like today, the relationship between Poland and Israel based on, um, on, on some of the latest comments that have been made by government officials and, and Poland's role in the Holocaust and Israel's comments on it. So we'll have back and forth discussions. We'll talk about um, the whole subject of righteous Gentiles. We'll talk about the subject of theology in the Holocaust. We'll talk about the role of the Vatican during, during this period of World War II and what could have been done and, and the possible bombing. So we'll, we'll be looking at a number of issues. We welcome your, your comments. We, we welcome some discussion. You know, I'll be coming back throughout the bus. Mel will be coming around. We'll be sitting, talking, hanging out. And, um, you know, those are the moments. And then at night, when we get back after dinner, you know, we're adults. So you want to go and sit in the lobby, sit at the bar. We sit and talk. And it's, it's a way to, to wind down after some of these tough places that we're going to see. And really to sit together as a group of adults and, 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 and talk about the day or talk about whatever we want as a group is one of those things that we'll look back on as well. So it, it's 8.15. We've been together now. I know Mel's got stuff to give out to you. Are there any questions that you have? And we've told the people that are watching via live stream, and they can text Mel at 305-338-6697. Any questions? And if any of you have any questions, um, any, any particular individual questions, you can ask Mel after, because in a few minutes when we're done and Mel finishes his announcements, 
out in the little lobby outside the sanctuary. We'll have coffee, and Mel brought some nice nashes for you. And he provides great nashes on the And you should bring some little snacks. Yeah, Mel's good at that. If you haven't figured it out by now, I'm a foodie. Let me tell you that my spec sheet for this trip is remarkable. You will have no less than two kinds of vodkas, potato and grain. We'll have no less than a 12-year-old scotch. In the famous words of our beloved survivor, we once brought on Johnny Walker Red, which is a seven-year-old. And Martin says, are you kidding? That's for truck drivers. I don't drink Johnny Red. We should have at least black or something better. So we have, we have nothing less than a 12-year-old if you're a scotch drinker. And we'll do our best to have single malt, but it may be a blend. My apologies up front. Vodka in Poland is cheaper than water, so we'll have plenty of vodka. But the point is to, 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 numb the, to numb the pain and to give everybody a little ruach. But on the bus, just to let you know, we're trying very hard to be as accommodating as possible in terms of needs. Our bus will be loaded with snacks and fresh fruit every day. I'm a chocoholic. There'll be no less than three different flavors. There'll be nuts without salt. There'll be snacks with salt. There'll be usually bananas, apples, and, and oranges. And it's important for you to understand, Belvita snacks in the morning. Uh, um, na uh, uh, you know, um, nature bars, stuff like that. If in between meals you want a chapanash, there'll be plenty of stuff, so nobody should go hungry. What else? I'm going to teach you something after day one, which you'll do, and it becomes a, 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 an act of nature. We, we eat these beautiful breakfast buffets. I, I'm telling you, Breakfast is really, it's like a regular, like at any nice hotel here where you go for like a Sunday brunch. It's got everything. So I don't know how, but everyone, you sort of take snacks for, for lunch. So people make their own like little sandwiches with these delicious fresh rolls or they cut bread. And you'll see, you, you, you had no idea you were going to do it. And then everyone just does it because it, it becomes part of, of, and, of the and routine. And you, but just the food is not bad. We're not eating what the kids are eating. The kids are going to be eating out of paper boxes. Our lunch trays, for example, the day we're in Auschwitz and Birkenau, just to give you an idea, it'll, we're going to be there on May 2nd. May will be hot. I, we've been on marches in May where the kids are wearing tank tops. They don't really want to wear their march jackets. Obviously, you can't stick box lunches under a bus on an 80-degree weather. So they've gone ahead and they've rented out a hotel in Auschwitz, a four-star hotel. They're going to kosher the kitchen, and they're going to serve us real cooked food for lunch not necessarily sandwiches out of a box. So the food isn't bad, but what Mark's saying is, you take a baggie with you, you take, look, I, I'm, an, I'm a carboholic. I like the, the little danishes and the, and the little noshes from breakfast. The backpack becomes very, very uh, useful to you in Poland. Mel is the king of nushers. Mel, in my father's words, Mel is the king. That being said, and everything we said and everything that's gonna happen, I wanna tell you one thing. I'm in a sanctuary, so I can't say the word. Stuff happens, SH happens, that we don't expect, that we hope with the experience that we have, we deal with it and we move on. But we, we, we've been on so many marches where stuff happens and it just happens. The weather, uh, a tire, whatever happens, we go with the flow and you have to come in with this mindset. This is not a vacation. You all wanna go on vacation, go to Cabo, go, to, to go somewhere. This is a, 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 a really special learning experience together. We happen to be going to this foreign, really there's some beautiful places we've seen, but we're also seeing some really difficult places. And to keep everything in context, it's really important. I remember one year we went and we're, we're in a really difficult place and someone says, come on, I gotta get back. I have a dinner reservation in Warsaw. It, it's, it's got to be, or a massage. But we, I want, you know, we all go in the proper mindset, and I, I guarantee you I will set the tone immediately because that's my job as, as the educator for the group. So at this point, Mel's going to wrap it up and, and last couple things. Again, I'm going to give you all this information in writing. It's a lot easier. You can print it and you can save it. Um, a couple of folks came in afterwards. I'm sorry, these are the Goodmans. I didn't have your name badges ready for you. Uh, as you can see, most of our group is not here because a lot of people are out of town. What we're doing tonight will be taped, will be recorded. When I have the link, I'll send it out to all of you who are watching from the cyberspace. Um, as Mark mentioned, again, this is for the benefit of the Goodman, so you don't feel like you missed anything. Our real, orienta <coughs> excuse me, our real orientation session will take place the morning we start. 
on Tuesday, April 30th. You'll have your name badges. We'll go over all last minute announcements so that everybody from everywhere will have an opportunity. We felt Im it was important enough while we're here in Miami to hear from Martin so that he sets the tone for the various times during the trip that he'll share with us and that you'll have an opportunity to get an idea when you meet the person and then you read the book, you can put the two things together. Uh, Mark touched upon one thing and I want to close with that and that was the concept of we're adults. Listen, he mentioned it as uh, Forrest Gump said, it happens. Some people get up in the morning and they say, I, you know, I had a bad night, I didn't sleep, or my stomach is not good, or, or whatever. You'll have the schedule of the day. If, for example, we're in Krakow for an entire day, you'll know at noon you can rejoin the group at a particular place. Or if we're, you know, not leaving town in Warsaw, you'll say, okay, I'll catch you for the afternoon stuff because I can't make it in the morning. Perfectly okay. We'll, we'll give you all the tools you'll need. Understand that the International March of the Living fully staffs the trip with a dentist, and doctors, and medical personnel, and mental health professionals, should the need arise. We happen to have a doctor with us, but I don't think you're gonna be pressed into duty with us. Dr. Goldberg is with us. Um, you know, one time we had a gynecologist on the kids' trip. A lot of good he did. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mauricio. So, uh, we're, we are always security. I don't wanna leave tonight's session without discussing security. Um, our buses, our drivers, and our security guards Everything is coordinated. P people have asked, why does this trip cost so much money? Well, part of the reason is the amazing security. Our buses are looked after, are, lo are locked when we're not in it, are watched. They're not left unattended in strange places. Our drivers are vetted, they're pre-screened. Our security guards are coordinated by our Israeli staff people. Our pilot, uh, every, uh, you'll notice when we're on the trip, we'll pull in someplace and there'll be a cop waiting for us with the blues running. They know our schedule. We don't go anywhere without, without them knowing. We don't just go off on our own. Everything is on a grid, a time grid, so that we are fully secure. The hotels that we're in, you know, you notice when you came into the synagogue tonight, they looked at your bags, they, they did what they had to do. Similarly, when you go in and out of Auschwitz, our bags will be inspected. Things are, security's tight. Look, we have 10 Kanena Hora, maybe 12,000 Jewish people from around the world in one place at one time. Naturally, it sounds paranoid, but we have to prepare for that. And that's part of something which you don't need, I, I say this to you now, but you don't need to worry about it. My two kids went, my wife went, and I go every year. We're very concerned about security and we take it very seriously, so do not worry about that aspect. Cell phones, I'll send you information about that. Whatever you have here works there. Wi-Fi, wherever we go. By the way, we've attempted the last few trips to have Wi-Fi on the bus, and it works for the first five people. Once you get 40 people all signing on, forget it, it's history. So whatever data plan you have, Poland has excellent five-bar five, five bar service everywhere. Uh, the GSM network works great. So you'll have no problem staying in touch with everybody. Education materials. I'm, we're going to release to you before the trip Remember the old days when you took a trip on AAA, they had a trip tick where you flipped the page? We've created through the uh, amazing talents of the head educator for the teens, uh, Tamara Donenfeld. She worked here many years and now she's uh, director of education at uh, Beth Am in South Dade. You're going to get a trip tick for every place we go to. And there'll be a lot of statistics and a lot of stuff that you don't have to memorize. But, you know, when you're on the bus and we're driving to the place, you can open it up and take a look on your iPad or your phone, and it gives you great background information. Uh, we may, for example, be in Maidanek one day, and they're doing repairs on a particular barracks. If we can't get into that barracks, there are going to be pictures provided to you and say, that's what's going on in that building when they reopen it in six months. You know, so that you don't, we try to make sure that anticipate that you don't feel like you've lost out and these little triptychs are very helpful. And when you get back from the trip, make reference to them to remind you what you saw and, and the information that we shared with you. Um, again, you're going to get emails, lots of them. Questions before we break for coffee. Now, Mark mentioned it, and I'm going to repeat it. The most Im some of the most impactful times during the trip is the coffee time. When we stop on the bus for an hour to have a lunch or to use a bathroom, and people reflect and they, they're hanging out on the back of the bus and they're saying, wow, I can't believe what I just saw. We call that a March moment. And I'm not telling you that you have to have one. It'll happen. It'll happen naturally. And you'll have this aha moment. Not everything we're going to spoon feed you. And I can tell you the brilliance of this educator is what he doesn't say. Things are going to unfold for you. 
and you'll get the aha moment without, the kids are different. We, we have to kind of lay it out there for the kids so that they get the aha moment. But we won't, we won't have that problem. We're all adults. We'll have a different perspective on that. So again, you'll get a lot of stuff from me. Uh, coming up soon, you all got the laundry list. I'll resend it again. Understand, you look at the weather as we're going on the trip. Rain gear is the only thing we'll provide you. We don't have enough for everybody tonight, but we have for most people. There are five items we're giving you. The jacket has a hood. We've used it in snowstorms. We're not going to have the need for the warmth, but we may need it for water repellent. This beautiful dry fit shirt, we're all going to have one of those. A hat. That our, our hat will have our group name on it. Tote bag. We'll explain all that to you later, but some days you can use the backpack, some days you can't. And um, you'll also have an opportunity uh, to stay in touch with folks back home. Mind you, you're six hours ahead. It's very easy. They'll be waking up when our day is ending. Um, what did I miss for tonight? What's important? Okay. Any questions, we can mix outside. I know who I'm giving what tonight, and I know what I haven't given you. The, 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 no joking. The jackets are in a slow boat from China. They'll be here next week. So I had a few jackets, and to lighten my load so I don't have to schlep it to Poland or mail it out to you, the, a few of you will be getting some of the items tonight. Um, and if you don't get them tonight, don't worry. You'll have them before we leave to Poland. Again, any other questions for the people coming? I don't see any texts coming from those who are streaming in. So uh, thank you for coming. And I, I know it's uh, a middle of the week, and you have other things on your plate. But like anybody else, when you go skiing, you take ski lessons. You go on a trip like this, do your reading. Um, I sent you all a, a suggested reading list and a video list. Rewatch Schindler's List, seriously. Rewatch some of those things, you, even though you've seen them. Rewatch them. Uh, re Rewatch The Pianist. Rewatch re some of these movies. They, they really bring you back to what we're going to be seeing. And the more you're prepared, the better the experience. So I'm just going to say good night, everyone. And we look forward to uh, being together in, in Krakow. And in a few months, we're going to meet you out there. There'll be coffee and, and some cookies, and Mel's giving out stuff, and we're around here. So, to those watching uh, live stream, wow. All right. This looks like a Canadian question. It's a 416 area code. Uh, will our items be sent to us or received in Poland? Thankfully, Mark's going to be going to Toronto for Pesach. So, for you two people, or four people, Jill and Warren, if you're watching, and Maura and Debbie, your stuff, your swag, is that what they call it, will be taken by Mark Baranek uh, Pesach and hand-delivered. The name tags, the lanyards, will be given out during our first day in Poland so that people won't forget them at home. Okay, any other texts? All right, going, going, gone. Good night, everyone. Laila Tov, and we'll see you soon.